All right, hello everybody. I'd like to welcome you back to the uh, second panel in our four-day workshop on, um, on cyber politics in the Middle East. Uh, those of you who are able to join us on uh, Tuesday, you already know that this is a, uh, a jointly sponsored workshop by the Project on Middle East Political Science, the uh, CDDRL at Stanford, and Stanford's Global Digital Policy Incubator. Um, and on Tuesday, we talked about digital activism and some of the ways in which um, uh, social actors have been adapting to the current environment and finding ways to continue to use um, uh, social media and other forms of online engagement in order in, to, to pursue their various objectives. So today, what we want to do is talk about the authoritarian side of things and look in some detail into how exactly autocratic regimes in the Middle East have been uh, adapting to these digital challenges, the various forms of technology, uh, uh, legal approaches, and uh, various forms of repression by which they have met and adapted to the challenges posed by digital activists in the Middle East. We have um, four papers that are being presented. Uh, we'll hear um, in, in order from uh, Marwa Fatatha, uh, then we'll hear from Andrew Lieber and Alexei Abrams. After that, we'll hear from Mark Owen Jones. And finally, we'll hear from Zhao King, who plays an extremely important role on this panel, bringing in a perspective from China. In all four of our panels, we've attempted to bring in people who can get us out of Middle Eastern exceptionalism and look at the global terrain and find ways uh, to really think about the Middle East, not as something um, which is simply exceptional, but is part of a much broader set of patterns of, of, of political activism and, and uh, authoritarian repression. And so we're going to give about 10 or 12 minutes to each of our panelists. And uh, after that, we will uh, engage in discussion. Uh, you should be able to put questions for the panelists into the Q&A chat, and uh, we will uh, attempt to uh, address as many of them as we can. Um, and at this point, uh, with no further ado, uh, let us uh, move to our very first panelist. Uh, and Marwa, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mark, and um, hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be joining you today. Uh, and I'm glad I'm starting because what I want to do today is um, present a broader picture of what governments in the MENA region have been doing over the past decade since the Arab Spring, um, noting the power of the internet and what social media platforms and online spaces can provide to activists and citizens. Um, let's start by saying that um, since the Arab uprisings, um, governments in the region have taken a, a heavy handed approach to Internet regulation, um, where they see the Internet as a, some sort of a, a, a state territory that should be police controlled and um, walled off with certain borders that would allow what is permissible uh, on the Internet in terms of online speech and activity whether it be uh, passing repressive legislation such as cybercrime laws in different MENA jurisdictions to the use of internet shutdowns around uh, political protests, um, the use of um, surveillance technologies to monitor and uh, the activity and the, the movement of, of citizens, um, among other means, of course. But while they while governments in the region are trying to establish that sort of um, territory and control over the internet um, the internet and digital technologies have provided um, the governments the tools to expand their authoritarianism beyond their uh, geographical and jurisdictional borders and this is important to understand when we talk about digital repression and uh, authoritarianism in the region for two reasons. One is that many activists, um, including myself in the region have um, decided to flee their countries in fear of repressal or simply because the governments have been uh, trying systematically to annihilate uh, civil society, such as the case in Egypt, um, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, um, Syria and other countries but also because um, there, there's a geopolitical dimension where um, governments are not only interested in stifling freedom of expression in their own countries and, um, and violating those rights of their own citizens, but also trying to silence um, their political opponents living abroad. So we're talking here about um, mainly the Gulf countries, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are the first to come 
um, to mind when uh, we discuss transnational repression and how they're using those technologies to um, stifle and crack down on, on dissent. Um, and so if, you know, through my work at Access Now um, and previously, I can say that there are three main methods of digital transnational repression, and I'll go through them one by one. Um, the first one is the use of um, vague and overly broad um, uh, legislation um, that would enable cross-border censorship and prosecution. Um, this is most prominent um, in a country like Jordan, where in the past few years there have been a number of cases of journalists, uh, activists, or uh, simply internet users being prosecuted um, under the, the, the government of the country's counterterrorism law for um, disturbing, uh, for so called disturbing uh, Jordan's relationship uh, with foreign uh, states. And so uh, the most prominent, I mean, the one example that comes to mind is the case of the well known cartoonist Ahmad Hajjaj, who was arrested uh, because he published a satirical cartoon about the um, so called peace deal between the UAE and, um, and Israel. But he is not the first. Um, one, another example is a case of a Jordanian journalist back in 2015 who. Uh, wrote an online uh, column or article criticizing uh, Saudi Arabia's um, war on Yemen. Again, he was uh, arrested and imprisoned for under the same provision in the counterterrorism law for, you know, for disturbing or criticizing um, a foreign state. And it's important to note here that um, obviously Jordan is reliant on foreign aid um, and Gulf governments are in particular one of the um, strongest financial uh, supporters of, of, of Jordan. And so it's, I think that's one of the ways in which Gulf countries have co-opted um, the government of Jordan. And that's a tactic of um, transnational repression, whether it be online or offline, where the government tries to co-opt the hosting government or another government through whatever leverage, um, in this case, financial leverage, in order to uh, stifle and attack uh, activists living abroad. And by the same token, um, the UAE has done the same. Uh, so under the cybercrime law, um, a number of, uh, of, of Jordanian citizens, for example, who are resident in the UAE have been prosecuted um, for criticizing uh, the Jordanian government and for criticizing the, the Jordanian monarchy. So you see that this is some sort of an informal agreement perhaps that you know if you criticize um the Saudi government then we would be able to extend our national jurisdiction to prosecute those activists uh, as well um and the second method of trans or digital transnational repression is um, obviously uh the, the use of digital surveillance tools and uh, targeted uh, spyware to attack um citizens uh, and, and dissidents who are living abroad and here I think the most flagrant uh, case, for example, is the murder of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. And the entire uh, surveillance operation that was unfolded before, um, before his murder. So according to uh, an investigation by a, the Toronto-based uh, citizen lab, they found that um, the Saudi government has used the notorious um, Pegasus uh, spyware uh, developed by the Israeli um, company, the NSO group, to hack into the phones of uh, one of Khashoggi's friends, Omar Abdelaziz, an activist who lives in Canada since uh, 2009, and to monitor the private conversations between him and Khashoggi. And obviously, uh, for those of you who don't um, know Pegasus, it literally transforms, like once, inf once it infects your phone or your device, it, it transforms your phone into a, a small spyware, uh, sorry, a small um, spy device. It can, um, yeah, it can see your contacts, your uh, track your movements, turn on your mic, turn on your camera, everything you do and say on, on the device would be, um, would be seen by the, um, by the government or whoever is deploying um, that, uh, that spyware. Um, and of course, um, the, the use of those technologies is not something restricted to Saudi Arabia, but 
uh, we know through um, media investigations that Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Oman, uh, Morocco, and a number of other uh, governments in the region are one of the favorite clients of the NSO group um, and other companies that have provided over the years um, their surveillance technologies to governments, which would enable them to uh, spy on their citizens living abroad or in exile. And Saudi Arabia went even a step far into uh, recruiting um, two internal employees at Twitter headquarters in the US in order for them to spy on the communications or extract personal data of Saudi dissidents who are using um, Twitter and pass that information to the Saudi government. Um, they were charged by the US um, Department of Justice um, uh, with spying, uh, obviously, uh, for foreign state, in this case for Saudi Arabia. And unfortunately, I mean, one of the victims of that spy operation is, is um, Abdullah Sathan, who was recently sentenced to, I mean, first he, he was forcibly disappeared in, in 2018. His family didn't know uh, where he is and, and his whereabouts. Um, and only recently, I think in, uh, very recently, he was sentenced to uh, 20 years in prison. And, uh, so the Han was found out um, through this Twitter oper spy operation because he was using Twitter anonymously to criticize um, the Saudi government and the policies of, of MBS. Um, one last note on, on digital uh, surveillance um, in the region is um, that so beyond the purchase and use of sophisticated surveillance technologies, there is a new trend, and I would say even an ambition uh, by some countries, and namely the UAE, to develop their own homegrown surveillance technologies. And that's, that's really scary. Um, there has been a number of investigations, again, by media uh, showing, for example, one of the cyber so-called cybersecurity uh, companies in the UAE, uh, for example, uh, Dark Matter, who has been um, attempting to recruit um, ex uh, employee, I mean ex employees of the NSO group, but also ex veterans at the Israeli intelligence unit um, A200, uh, which is the equivalent of the U.S. Uh, NSA. Um, and then it see you, you, through that example and others, you see that the UAE is trying to um, recruit that kind of um, expertise in the U.S. but also in Israel. Um, in order to develop and build their own tactics and technologies. And in addition to that, obviously, the, uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia um, have been in recent years um, at some sort of a, an artificial intelligence race. Um, the UAE has started its own uh, or its first uh, ministry of artificial intelligence. I think it's the first in the world. Uh, both governments um, have included um, artificial intelligence and the development of that sector uh, as part of their economic plans or national plans. And uh, both are um, interested in uh, ensuring that they become tech hubs of uh, artificial intelligence and other technologies in the region. So you can see um, where those ambitions go into. And obviously with those two authoritarian regimes amassing uh, huge amounts of data or perhaps starting to export such technologies is, is worrying and diplomatic because then we can't talk about um, any of the uh, checks and balances that are present today, even though they're you know, weak and can be strengthened. But things like due human rights due diligence or impact assessments or expert controls, none of that um, I think could apply to uh, the cases of Saudi Arabia and the UAE once they have taken and arrived at the destination that they um, aim to. Um, the third uh, method of uh, transnational repression, uh, obviously online, is the use of, um, of disinformation campaigns and, and troll armies uh, to intimidate um, and threaten activists who are out of uh, the government's reach. And there are many examples, and I'm glad that we have Mark with us today because he's the disinfo expert, if I can call you that, and can share with us um, examples of how exactly um, governments have weaponized social media spaces to 
either legitimize their own policies and uh, whether it be on, on local level or at regional level, or to attack, delegitimize and smear activists who are out of their reach. Again, one of the cases um, is the case of Lujain Hadloul, Saudi Arabia, um, where she's been arrested in 2018 actually kidnapped when she uh, was in the UAE. And that's another method of, of offline transnational repression where you can just simply extradite or kidnap um, an activist. And, and there is a sort of security coordination between the Gulf states where in the case of Lujain, she was put on a private jet heading towards Saudi Arabia, um, put on a travel ban in the country and then arrested. And uh, later on, of course, charged with a a number of ridiculous um, accusations, including uh, supporting um, foreign entities and, and working with human rights organizations and journalists outside of Saudi Arabia under the cyber crime law. And Lujain and her family, her two sisters and brother who are living in exile at the moment, um, have been trolled day in and day out on, on Twitter and other social media uh, platforms. And, and this is again like one of the areas where governments are um, using their troll armies uh, and other state sanctioned um, uh, activists and accounts and whatnot in order to um, delegitimize and smear those activists. Um, I'll stop here and um, yeah, and I look forward to continuing this conversation later. Thank you, Marwa, for that uh, that fantastic uh, opening and overview of, of transnational repression, transnational digital repression, and especially like the way that you um, connect the offline to the online. I think a lot of people will have this idea that things that are online aren't real in some way. And I think in our world, I think we can see how real those connections actually are. So thanks for highlighting that. Um, why don't we go now to our second paper by uh, Andrew Lieber and Alexi Abrams. I believe Andrew is speaking first and, um, and then Alexi will join halfway through. Uh, great. Thanks so much, Mark. And thanks so much, everyone, for being here. I'm just going to share my screen to get us started and get this underway. Um, so I'm going to be presenting with my colleague, Alexa Abrams, today on our paper, Inauthenticity, Inequality, and Insecurity, Monitoring the Middle East's Digital Discourse. Um, and I think what we're trying to do with this paper is nuance what seems to have become almost the dominant dis way of thinking about um, what pro-regime social media or pro-government social media activity on what is. Um, not to say that, you know, I think most of the people participating in this workshop probably you know, wouldn't describe this view at this point, but this has become almost a dominant view in the media that, you know, this is um, sort of bot and troll armies that are all centrally controlled by like one individual sitting in an office in a basement somewhere that is just sort of like pulling the strings behind everything and it's all sort of centrally controlled. Whereas recent work, including by people on this panel and other panels in this workshop has showed that, you know, automated accounts and bond armies um, and centrally controlled efforts are just one part of a broader picture. And then for some aspects of uh, sort of pro-regime social media activity might not be the most important part. And so what Alexei and I are talking about in this paper is thinking of this in terms of what we call the three eyes, because it seems like everything in social media uh, studies comes in threes. Um, so first of all, you know, there's been a lot of work on sort of inauthenticity, the way that bots can be used either by state actors or sort of individuals or non-state actors to create and warp, to sort of warp online discussions. But two other aspects we think um, should be brought into us are thinking about the ways that online conversations are structured around hierarchy. So first, the idea that you know, there's an inequality of voice in most social media spaces. You know, I can tweet something and it'll get like one or two retweets. But if, you know, some individuals online with like a million, you know, Beyonce tweets something online, I, I think she's on Twitter. Uh, lots of people retweet it because you just, a lot more people are following Beyonce than, than me. Um, but, you know, both state officials are able to take advantage of this, but also individuals are able to sort of build up followings online. Um, and that's something that we're, we'll talk about more. And also the implications of this for insecurity as well. Sort of if it's only really a handful of individuals individuals that are driving either pro-regime or anti-regime discourse, then that means it can be much easier to sort of warp things than we might think. If you think of sort of repressing a few key individuals versus a lot, then that really shapes the, the, the strategies that are available to states and what their strategies are. Um, so first of all, obviously, a lot of work that's come out of the, the sort of regional studies approach to sort of disinformation campaigns, including, you know, Marco and Jones, myself, Alexei, others on this, uh, has been focusing on the role of bots and sort of inauthentic activities, sort of where 
digital automation tools can give the impression of online popularity or authenticity. And then this has been a major media focus as well, sort of your periodic takedowns on Twitter of sort of bot networks that have been studied by some of the people that I think we'll present later in the workshop. Um, but at times this almost risks becoming just the default explanation for any sort of pro-regime content we see. Like it's, you know, Saro Kartanier, his minions fired up the, you know, the, the, the fake accounts and then just hit send on like 10 million tweets. And that's what we see, which is certainly part of it. But what we're trying to say is maybe not all of it. So in a recent paper that Alexei and I did, we looked at like, you know, several hundred hashtags that had trended in the region over the past, um, I think 2019 through early 2020. And generally, we found that, you know, bots were certainly present in almost every conversation, but we're only really dominating a handful of these really small, almost sort of marginal hashtags, which isn't to say that bots and suspicious accounts might not play a role in sort of boosting the visibility of these and getting user engagement, but, but they're not sort of the only thing going on here. Um, and likewise, sort of while it's a constant struggle to identify what are even suspicious accounts to begin with, just some of the features of what might be suspicious doesn't necessarily mean that it's sort of a bot or state linked account. For example, you know, it's quite common to find sort of uh, suspicious accounts that uh, have never changed their profile picture or their username is like a super long alphanumeric string, but, but that's sort of like the default setting if you just get on Twitter and are using it to, um, if you just get on Twitter and are using it to, um, to uh, that's sort of the default if you're just getting on Twitter and just using it to follow news stories or something of that nature. So, you know, it may just be that these individuals are using Twitter in a way that like an academic or a journalist or someone who's very online and loves memes uh, you would not be using it. Um, and sort of, sort of building off this then what we think what we wanted to sort of bring into this conversation, what we started to think about in our own work is thinking more about sort of the impact of influencers, sort of the ways that, you know, real sort of, I don't want to say real, but, but the ways that um, users on Twitter or other social media sites who built up these followings online are then in turn able to leverage that to sort of sway uh, Twitter activity, social media activity, either in a sort of pro-regime direction or, uh, you know, an anti-regime direction. The way that regimes have taken notice of this and the ways that it perhaps opens new strategies for them beyond sort of automated activity. Um, so in thinking about this, you know, there's extensive evidence, especially from Saudi Arabia and elsewhere in the region of uh, state actors, you know, sort of thinking, how can I co-opt or coerce existing influences? You know, there are individuals like Jamal Khashoggi who had built up sort of a prominent media presence over decades of, of uh, journalistic and commentary work who had, you know, over a million Twitter followers or something, but that then in turn, made them sort of a target for somebody like uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman or Saud al-Qahtani, his sort of Twitter social media czar, um, who then in turn would either, you know, bring people in who had prominent platforms and say, hey, why are you tweeting these critical things? Like, that doesn't seem like a good idea. Or sort of thinking of other ways that they might be able to incentivize people, whether it's through access or perhaps through financial reward or just, you know, the knowledge that you have good connections with the royal court to in turn incentivize these individuals to, you know, put out sort of pro-regime content, which then seems, you know, perhaps a little bit more credible than if it's like, you know, the, the Ministry of the Interior's official account tweeting how great the Saudi government is, if it's someone who's known as, you know, like a sports commentator or something might, might play a role in this. Um, additionally, we've seen regime figures themselves playing extensive roles online. So uh, Saudo Kartani, who again has been, or who has been banned from Twitter for manipulating the platform uh, as a state linked agent, um, has also just spent an inordinate amount of time online uh, to the point that at one point when Alexei and I wrote a paper that discussed Soto Kartani, one reviewer comment was like, well, obviously this man can't work for the security services because he's so public and online all the time, but like, no, <laughs> it's just, he wouldn't, how could he do, but like, anyway, as all of us who use social media, you know, it's very easy to get sucked into this stuff. So, you know, I, I can at least understand where that's coming from, but, but, you know, he spent an inordinate amount of time posting stuff like this. You know, he's sort of mocking the enemies of the kingdom by calling Qatar like the, the East Selwa Island, like making fun, like there's an obsession with making fun of how small Qatar is geographically. That is, and then also sort of constantly praising the kingdom's leadership and posting photos of the crown prince and the king and sort of garnering lots of retweets and likes for this. Now, certainly lots of those retweets and likes could just be bots that he himself certainly purchased, but but at least had like a fairly large online presence and, um, you know, would, would garner media coverage for, you know, Saud al Ghattani smites the enemies of the kingdom again. So, so you know, there are other figures like him who have similar roles. And then, so the third sort of group, which is kind of the hardest to pin down is you have individuals who, 
are sort of very pro government online and you know a significant part of their sort of you know in the same way that obviously you know the United States like some political figures have built up their social media presence sort of solely promoting other political figures or aligning with the political views of certain persons who shall not be named here, um, you know, you wind up with these individuals who are either sort of media commentators, journalists, or just like ordinary people who are relatively ordinary people who have now become these very influential individuals, you know, like in this sort of hashtag campaign that was like praising Saro Kartani years after he's been forced from the platform, you had people with sort of millions of followers tweeting out, um, you know, like Saro Kartani is great, like bring him back, whatever. Um, and again, could be still sort of centrally coordinated behind the scenes, but it's being relayed through all of these individuals and their hundreds of thousands of followers. Um, and somewhat interesting, you know, started by this individual, Mohammed Assad, who has like the fewest followers out of any of them, but like spends an awful lot of time in his newspaper columns, like praising the kingdom, like like sort of basically trolling for online content in the fishing sense, like trying to you know, build up his profile online. So. Um, that's just sort of a view of what these sort of people look like or would look like to if you were using Twitter. Now I'm going to turn it over to my co-author Alexei, who's going to talk a bit more about how we um, sort of incorporate these structures then into our work in terms of, you know, trying to pin down exactly what all this means for the study of, of, of online mobilization and for sort of regime, pro-regime activity online in general. And I'll stop sharing so you can share his. Hi, can, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, thanks very much um, to my colleague, Andrew. And actually, Andrew and I have been tracking uh, Twitter activity in the Middle East and North Africa for almost uh, four years now. Um, so this hashtag uh, right here, Jamal Khashoggi, obviously trended in the immediate aftermath of Khashoggi's murder in Istanbul in October 2018. Um, and we can, we can look at it to get a sense of just how bad the inequality is on social media that, that Andrew was just talking about. So I cannot emphasize enough how unequal Twitter is. It is in fact like far uh, uh, more unequal than basically any economy um, in the world at the moment. So for example, in this, in this sample of data, we've got 2.4 million tweets, 370,000 participants in this hashtag conversation of whom about, I think 70,000 actually tweeted something original. But among those, just 50, right? Just 50 participants uh, garnered 50% of the retweets. And I think it was about 280 um, garnered 80% uh, um, of, the, of, the, of the retweets. Uh, so here, I mean, here's a graph that economists often use to look at inequality in economies. You, you can just see it's an incredible skew, just the last sort of percent of, of users that's driving the whole conversation. You could, in fact, just um, filter out what almost everybody in the conversation said and just look at these handful of, of influencers and you would get to a first approximation what the whole conversation was about. And there you see in the in the purple pro-Saudi camp, Mumder72, the, the influencer that Andrew was talking about a moment ago, and he's not explicitly a member of the Saudi regime. He's just, a, he reports himself as a, as a prominent businessman. Um, here again, he reappears also with uh, Al Arabiya and some other Saudi accounts. You might think this hashtag has to do with Saudi Arabia. It does not really. It's actually hashtag Lebanon, which trended in the immediate aftermath of the uh, Beirut port explosion last August. And again, 1.4 million tweets, uh, 434,000 participants, but just a few hundred that drive um, half of the discourse. Now, that's not to say. Um, you know, Twitter has no borders, so we're, we're seeing Saudi influencers in hashtags all over the region. That's not to say that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, I think a lot of scholars in this community um, are now working on foreign influence research, but we just got to remember that, uh, you know, we, we don't want to normalize this sense of information sovereignty and that information space should be treated like airspace. Uh, you know, we want kind of a, a unified and worldwide internet. Um, and at the same time, you know, the economist in me asks, well, what's so bad? Is inequality necessarily bad? Like in, a, in any given conversation, you're going to have folks who are a little more articulate, uh, more, more charismatic, and will, will 
capture more attention in the conversation. So what's so bad about this? Well, a lot of this is actually anticipated by our colleague uh, uh, Marwa in her presentation. So I won't have to say much here, but just to give you an example. So from the last few weeks, um, there've been these, uh, obviously everybody's been watching the incredible mobilization happening in Palestine. And so Andrew and I tracked the top hashtags that trended during that, during the mobilization. And you can see over in the, in the column that says percent of tweeters garnering 80% of upvoting, it's a very small percentage, right? So for example, in Save Sheikh Jarrah, in uh, the English version, for example, just a half percent of all the tweeters um, garner 80% of all the upvoting. It's just less than 2,000 people out of 400,000. And uh, of course, we can visualize these folks, these uh, 1,933 influencers, and they themselves uh, have a lot of inequality in and among themselves, right? So there's some, you can see some very big nodes, like a big purple node, and these big green nodes. Those are, those are really, even among the influencers, they are the most influential. And what freaks me out about these kind of data is just imagine this in the hands of Israeli intelligence, right? This is basically a list of all the prominent voices, uh, at least the ones that use Twitter, um, in the Palestinian movement and struggle for social justice. And, you know, if you're not thinking of this book, this incredible and terrifying book by uh, Roman Bergman from a few years ago, then, then you should. The Israeli intelligence has a long history of identifying uh, the, the heads and the, the, the most prominent figures in the Palestinian movement, be they novelists or poets, be they armed militants, uh, and, and, and eliminating them. So this is kind of, these sort of data are a bit of an operational security disaster. Um, now, I don't know, you know, that said, we'll leave it to the Q&A as to how do you conduct a worldwide movement for social justice online without um, having a vanguard of influential figures. But, you know, it, this is a direction the literature can go. But really, um, you know, so I think Marwa anticipated all of these points really, but, you know, regimes are using these data to figure out who's influential and then they're assassinating them, they're arresting them, um, they are intimidating them, intimidating their relatives, they're surveilling them with NSO spyware, uh, they are hiring moles inside of um, Twitter, um, they are also passing laws to intimidate ordinary citizens, um, they're trolling and harassing people. I'm sure several people on this call, uh, I know Mark um, for sure, uh, uh, Mark Jones, um, has suffered trolling and harassment um, exactly for this sort of reason. Um, so anyway, just to sum up the, the three eyes, you know, it's a bit of a gimmick, uh, but inauthenticity, right, the bots and fake news and so on, inequality, the fact that there's just a handful of people driving the discourse, insecurity, which kind of follows from the inequality, and then the fact that it's not all top-down. So there's, there's, there is top-down regime stuff, but then there's also like more ambiguous figures like Mondar 72, um, and Amjad Plaha and other folks in that category. Um, and then there's the sort of the decentralized mobs and trolls of, uh, of that, that we, I don't really know if they're centrally commanded. Um, so some caveats and thoughts for future research, which we can look at more in the Q&A. But uh, one thing is content moderation, which actually Hamle and Access Now, and again, Marwa has been bringing up in the past few weeks, doesn't really fit our, our three I gimmicky categories. So that's something to consider. Um, but just the, the melding that Andrew and I have been doing between contextual knowledge and big data to figure out not just what's happening in the region, but how much, can you quantify it? Can you give it a, you know, everything happens at least once on the internet. So can you give it some sense of, of proportion? Um, and then uh, it's also a cat and mouse game, right? So authoritarians are adjusting their repertoires and it's evolving even as um, resistances. And I think actually our colleague, Mark uh, Jones is about to talk about that evolution. So I will pass it over. Wonderful. Thank you, Alexei and, and Andrew for the great presentation. And especially thank you for adding in the brand new data uh, on uh, Sheikh Zarah, which wasn't in the original paper and it's fascinating to see. Um, why don't we go to the Dean of Misinformation, uh, uh, Mark Owen Jones. Um, and Mark, you can take um, more like uh, 13 or 14 minutes since um, we are short a panelist. So, uh, don't abuse, don't abuse this gift. <laughs> 
I, I will try my best not to abuse it um, or even come close. But every time I say I'm going to keep it short, it tends to go over. So I don't want to jinx it either. Just going to share my screen and we should be good to go. You all can see that, yeah? Looks Thanks. Good. I know Alexi likes this little picture. It's one of his favorites. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me here. It's great to be uh, with some familiar faces and hi to everyone who's tuned in. Um, I'm, I'm, I, well, while this might look a bit dry and technical and some bits of it are, um, I want to talk about how uh, deception tactics, particularly the use of bots, have evolved. And I think it's interesting, uh, Andrew and Alexi have talked about, you know, not everything is bot, a bot, which is true. Um, but the, the message I want to take away from this is that uh, when there's so much we don't know, how much can we say that we actually know for sure, right? And, and this is one of the perennial issues with, with Twitter and Twitter data. The more we know that we're being manipulated, the more we can look back on previous research and think, hang on, if we had applied these uh, criteria to this assessment of data, maybe we would have found that some of these accounts were more problematic than we initially thought. So there's a lot of issues here, and part of this stems from Twitter's lack of transparency and, and multitudes of things like that. Um, so just kind of preamble, uh, I think what's really interesting about the current state of affairs we're in, whether we're political scientists, area studies people, language experts, uh, human rights activists, is that the burden of responsibility for determining what is true and, and, and what's not true has, fall, has fallen uncomfortably along on our shoulders in a way. We can't necessarily, we don't, the, the regulation around disinformation, fake news, online intimidation, harassment, in a global sense, so patchy and often non-existent, um, that that's not really a sufficient uh, mitigator of, of these kind of online ills or online harms, as we might call them. Uh, and so a lot of as a lot of this kind of effort in terms of monitoring and, and finding this is falling on the shoulders of activists, journalists, academics like us. Uh, and so we really need to work together to be able to actually identify tactics of deception and share that knowledge. So hopefully this will this presentation will also highlight a bit behind the black box of why we call things bots or manipulation or influential influence operations. I think it's important for us to be transparent about this. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how these things have changed really over about um, the past five or six years, um, because I think these techniques are useful to know. Um, when people ask you, is this a bot? I'm like, well, maybe, maybe not. But here's why I think it might or might not be. Um, and to con not contradict Mark's point earlier, Mark, Mark you, um, you, you said we need to bring in some from China so to, to end this Middle East exceptionalism, which I totally agree. But the funny thing is, is when I'm, I've been on panels where it's people who ignore the Middle East, I have to fight the case for making the Middle East relevant. So it's kind of flipped that bit. So I just thought it would be useful to sort of say uh, or apologize uh, on, on, on behalf of Middle East scholars to the rest of the world that there has, ten, there has tended to be a focus with things like platform manipulation on places like China um, uh, and Iran and Russia. Uh, and, and, you know, there is a, there's a growing a sense of, of, of need to actually study the Middle East or, or there needs to be more global attention on, on the Middle East. And this is particularly true, uh, I'll just skip ahead, um, when we actually consider what we know, the known quantities of manipulation coming out of the Middle East. I mean, if you look at Twitter's official takedowns of um, state-backed information of influence operations, uh, you can actually see if you combine Saudi Arabia's takedowns with Saudi UAE and Egypt, which have been uh, amalgamated by Twitter, but if you add them together, you'll see that behind China, they're the, the most documented abusers of Twitter as a platform. Uh, and now that probably doesn't surprise people. I mean, as Marwa said in the introduction, you know, we, we, we're aware that Saudi attempted to infiltrate Twitter. We, we know um, uh, MBS has met uh, Jack Dorsey, the CEO, several times. So we know that there's an importance placed on that. But I think it's important to demonstrate empirically that these, uh, you know, the Saudi, UAE and Egypt have, you know, been caught with their hands in the till, uh, for want of a better phrase, uh, several times, and they are one of the worst offenders for it. So that needs to be known. And that, again, reiterates the, the emphasis that we need to start looking at the region as not just uh, uh, an ent a, a place that attempts to influence domestic audiences, but that has become increasingly ambitious in its attempts to uh, export disinformation into international audiences. So it's a net exporter of disinformation as well as an importer, if you want to put it like that. Um, but just going back a bit, I mean, and so, you know, whilst that sets the case for looking in the Middle East and why it's important, um, you know, ultimately we still will have these questions that we need to answer and we will need to keep asking and answering these questions uh, uh, you know, 
indefinitely. If we're monitoring social media, we need to we need to know how propaganda, manipulation, disinformation, fake news, whatever you want to call it, is evolving, whether it's computational or non-computational. So whether it's bots or trolls, we need to we need to figure out how we can best detect it. How is it evolving? And also, how can the development of monitoring techniques of manipulation tell us about Twitter governance and MENA? Many of us will have heard um, or even believe, you know, that, for example, I mean, I increasingly do believe that uh, social media companies, and this isn't new, uh, tend to view the developing world as a sort of um, a regulatory backwater, a place that could be exploited, uh, you know, uh, in, for, for, for financial uh, benefits with little accountability. Uh, you know, there's, there's the notion of techno imperialism where you exploit those regions uh, and, and there is a lack of accountability. And, and, and that's an important dynamic, you know, to what extent is this digital orientalism that exists? And how can even just looking at the way Twitter appear to deal with platform manipulation actually reaffirm those beliefs that we have? So I just want to talk a little bit about how things used to be when it came to identifying things like bots, for example. Um, what, what was a very common tactic, um, I know I've worked on with this Alexi, was looking at uh, Twitter accounts that thousands of accounts would be created in a very short space of time. And when you looked at a sample of a hashtag, whatever the hashtag was, you'd be able to analyze the hashtag and, for example, see, wow, there was like a thousand accounts created uh, in one month, right? When the average amount of accounts created per month is about 70. That's anomalous. And all those accounts are now tweeting about the same thing. That's another anomaly. So why is that the case? And that would usually be a very good indicator um, that there were bots active on a hashtag. And frequently in the case of the Gulf, most of these, uh, a lot of these accounts, thousands of accounts that were created on in a very short space of time belonged or released were promoting content from the Saudi news channel, Saudi 24. Um, and much of that content was either disinformation or it was, in, it was very kind of pro Saudi propaganda. And sometimes it was sectarian hate speech. There was a lot of variety there. Um, what's very interesting about this, and again, this reflects on governance of Twitter. This is again, a crude manipulation method. It's not hard to detect. Uh, I'm not a computer scientist. Um, and maybe I'm above average intelligence. I don't know, I'll leave that for you to judge. But I was able to de detect these things and I informed Twitter back in 2016 and they suspended a number of accounts. However, this practice actually, it's less common now to have hashtags in which you see thousands of accounts created on the same day, but it was going strong until, it says 2019 here, but 2020, I was still identifying large networks of, of accounts, uh, manipulating hashtags, particularly around politics related to Saudi, that identified that had this crude signature of, of, of platform manipulation using accounts created on a certain amount of day. Another example is when the Riyadh agreement was signed, uh, thousands of these bot bots suddenly were deployed to kind of promote uh, the, the role, the message that Sadi was a peacemaker. And so there's a question there, how in four years was this very crude form of manipulation not addressed by Twitter? Uh, and I think, again, these are the important questions we need to be asking of these social media companies. Uh, this is just an example of what those anomalies look like. This is a kind of graph of, you know, if, if you see on the bottom, you can see that the, the um, uh, this graph basically shows uh, a sample of tweets from the Ittifaq uh, Riyadh, the Riyadh Agreement hashtag. Uh, and what on the bottom, you can see the months uh, and the months and the year of the account creation where the Twitter account was created. And on the left, you can see the number of accounts. And what, you, what this shows you is that, uh, you know, there was a, a very low average amount of new accounts within that sample of hashtags created every month. But then on certain, uh, on a couple of certain months, uh, we see thousands of accounts being created. And each of the, the colors within the bar represents a particular day within the month. So here you can see a very, you can see that the Ittafaq Riyadh hashtag was clearly manipulated by bots created on the same day. Um, <clears throat> but then things, you know, things have changed somewhat. Um, Here's another example of uh, something that trended in Kuwait. Um, this was, uh, a, it was, it was about a, a former MP, uh, Saleh Mullah, and it was accusing him of being drunk and it was saying, ah, oh, the drunk former MP and calls his drunk followers to the square. Um, and this hashtag, again, didn't necessarily have these kind of key markers of account creation date being, being the indicator that they were bots. But what it did have, if you organize these, um, Hash, this hashtag chronologically, you could see that whoever started the hashtag was solely using the application TweetDeck to start off the hashtag, right? 
So it couldn't have been an organic hashtag because whoever started it with people using the identical platform to send out those tweets, right? And then what happened is that it got picked up organically by Q80 Twitter users. Um, and so again, that shows us a number of things, not least that there's another way of spotting uh, manipulation, which is to look at how a trend originated, the initiation. Uh, but then it also raises the issue of like who's dictating what people talk about. So even if you, for example, looked at a hashtag of, you know, and this ties in a bit with what Andrew and Alex are saying, if you, you looked at a hashtag and say, actually, most of the behavior on this hashtag is organic. What does that matter if the whole reason for that discussion was actually initiated by someone who wanted to manipulate that discourse anyway, right? It's about who's defining the conversations as well as who's having those conversations, right? Uh, and I think that's a really key thing to, to, to bear in mind. If you can manipulate the initiation of a conversation, which is what influence will probably do, uh, then you, you're winning half the battle. It doesn't matter who's actually speaking later on, especially if they can't criticize anyone. Um, just as another example, network analysis can also be useful in identifying uh, suspicious behavior. Um, just this is an interesting example. Uh, last year, uh, Tawakko Karman, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, was uh, appointed to the Facebook Oversight Council. Um, and this seemed to provoke the Saudi and the Emiratis, who then, uh, well, I say they launched, I don't know if it was them, but there was certainly a lot of online activity that was uh, criticizing the appointment. There was many hashtags such as no to Facebook caliphate that were saying that, you know, Tawakkal Karman, it's Muslim Brotherhood and she's gonna bring terrorism to Facebook. Uh, a lot of hyperbole, obviously. Um, but here you can see from this network analysis graph and for those who are less familiar, network analysis is just a way of uh, visualizing uh, relationships between different Twitter accounts. So on these graphs, each of the little nodes, the dots represent a specific account, the lines between them represent retweets or tweets or mentions. But crucially what you can do with this, you can analyze a hashtag and detect different communities. And the first thing you might notice is that there's a, a lot of activity going in the top right quadrant. And then you have this green section in the bottom left quadrant. Um, and again, without needing to be technical, what the bottom left quadrant is, it, it indicates a, a group of accounts that were not really party to the main discussion uh, but that were very active on this hashtag. And when you look further at these accounts, they were again using all, they were all using Twitter for Android. Most of them had been created on the same day. And, and what this showed that within the community, they were artificially driving a conversation, but they were not organically part of this natural conversation. And network analysis allows us to get an insight into that kind of manipulation, um, which is, which is uh, useful. Again, you can see the image here. If you look in the bottom left quadrant, you can see that kind of turquoisey color. We color them by the application they're using. We get a very strong visual that that group of accounts there is clearly its own thing, uh, and they're up to in this case no good. Um, what we're seeing now is a, another development, and this is interesting because this this is almost diametrically opposed to the previous uh, network analysis, um, which I'll get to in a second. What we've seen since the uh, I think it was February or January where the released uh, the CIA report was released. Uh, about the role of, or the potential role of Mohammed bin Salman in ordering Jamal Khashoggi's killing. Um, we saw a lot of uh, hashtags about Khashoggi then. And what we started to see was this form of chopped hashtags. If you look at the top, you can see um, in the Arabic, it reads, uh, what do we benefit from the vision? Which was an account critical of, a hashtag critical of the vision 2030. And then if you look below, we saw another hashtag, which is just the first word of that, Merda underscore. And that was trending. And this became, we've seen this, I've seen this dozens of times now, where a small section of a critical hashtag of MBS then trends. And, and this is trending not because, here's some more examples of, of that kind of cropping of hashtags. Apologies if you don't, if you don't read Arabic, but uh, I've highlighted some of those things so you can kind of see uh, how that works. I'll just race through that. But rather than being related, like in the, in the Tawakal Kalman graph, we saw that there was this kind of separate community, but they were interacting with each other. What happens with these ones is almost the opposite. None of these accounts, and you can see in this graph on the right, if you look at the sort of bottom four fifths of this graph, you see these tiny little dots and boxes. What this shows you is that these accounts are not interacting with one another. So this is the equivalent of, imagine loads of random people unknown to each other started randomly tweeting uh, a chopped hashtag. The odds of that happening are non-existent unless it's coordinated. Um, and the, and, and in, in addition to that, they also, most of them use like Twitter web clients, but these accounts are all 
good accounts in the sense that they weren't all created in a very short time frame, right? So the normal standards of anomaly detection using account creation wouldn't have worked in trying to identify this form of manipulation. Um, so again, we see another evolution in the different types of manipulation. I'm not gonna talk about puppet masters yet because we can talk that in the Q and A. But I, what I do wanna say is, or finish by saying is that, of course we see an evolution in the techniques of propaganda, but that's not always an evolution. This is sometimes just an evolution in the ability of analysts like ourselves to be able to detect them. Maybe these forms of manipulation have been going on for time and we just haven't seen them or I, we haven't identified them correctly before. Uh, in which case, what does that say the validity of previous research? Uh, does it mean we, in theory, go back to our data sets and then apply our new techniques of detecting deception to those data sets in order to say, oh, were these, is this data actually legitimate um, before? Um, and it goes to show that we need to constantly monitor this activity in order to, to, to continually update our ability to detect deception. Because as, as if we treat whoever's manipulating this as adversaries, uh, then they will obviously try to improve their ability to avoid detection. And so we have to do the same. And when, for the most part, we don't, there's a lack of transparency in what social media companies are doing to actually detect this, then we, again, it comes down to us to be able to do that. Um, and again, what this shows us is that there's so much manipulation going on that the social media companies are not catching. And we have to ask ourselves, why are they not catching that? It's crude. So there's, there's mainly, I think, three, three reasons why they can't, they're, they're unable to. Uh, they're apathetic, they're indifferent, or, or at fourth, they could be malicious, right? They could know about it and, and, and just ignore it. And I think that's, a, that's something we have to consider because uh, just to end on this, I mean, one of the most shocking things I found recently, which was hiding in plain sight, was, was the fact that there seems to be an authoritarian caveat for, for um, avoiding Twitter's uh, political advertising uh, kind of message, right? So Twitter doesn't allow paid for political advertising, uh, which seems like a legitimate thing. Um, obviously in authoritarian countries where democracy is limited, political advertising is a relative moot point. But what you can do, when, when again this Jamal Khashoggi report came out in February, it was very interesting because there was suddenly this, this Twitter card, which is a, it's a function, an advertising function in Twitter that you have to have approval to do. And it was basically a card, a picture of MBS and a, a slogan saying, uh, we will support the leadership, et cetera. And you could just click on it and it would populate your tweet with the identical text and it would send it. So this just allowed this message to go viral. So essentially it was, a, it was an advertising function praising the crown prince. And I was like, how is this not, for example, contravening uh, Twitter's political advertising laws? Well, you actually go, you have to go to Twitter's FAQs on their political advertising. And there's a caveat that says, we allow, or we permit the salutations of loyalty to, to the royalty or promoting it, right? So I was like, how is that? That's insane, right? Someone must have lobbied for that. The fact that you can't in democracies uh, pay for political advertising, but in authoritarian regimes, you are able to, to lionize the, the, the leaders uh, on the sort of dodgy pretext that this is just a cultural tradition. When in fact, you know, it's, you, you, in, you know, in a regime where you can be imprisoned for criticizing the, the ruler, then it's not really a, a fair point to make. Anyway, I just want to say, like, the, the final thing I want to say is, I'll just read it out. Um, we may be certain of what is false, but we cannot be certain of what is real, right? So at some point, we know what is false. We can identify bots with a reasonable degree of certainty. We can identify trolls with some degree of clarity. But we cannot be certain that what we say or claim is real at any one time is actually real, because we don't 100% know. And this is why we need a paradigm shift. You know, 10 years ago, at the beginning of the Arab uprisings, I think it was legitimate to say, come across a social media account and assume you were talking to a real person. I think there's enough around now that without fully, you know, legitimate, just seeing someone's credentials or some sort of trustful verification, it's, no, it's, it's fine to be suspicious. And we have to be suspicious because that's good digital literacy. Uh, and it's bad for trust. And, and uh, you know, as a, obviously democracy is important for this discussion, what kind of, what role does social media play when we don't trust each other? because that really militates against our ability to form strong networks and, and, and mobilize. Uh, not that I want to discourage trust, but I'm just saying it's a balancing act. We need to protect ourselves at the same time uh, as trying to hopefully mobilize. Anyway, I'll stop there and um, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, could you unshare your screen? Yeah, I got you.
Great, and we're delighted that Zhao has uh, has uh, joined us now, and uh, we can get some perspective um, from the Chinese experience with digital authoritarianism, and hopefully get some really good comparative perspective here. Uh, Zhao, thanks for joining us, and uh, uh, I will give you the floor. Thank you. I'm sorry I uh, uh, joined in a bit late, uh, uh, misunderstanding. Uh, how much time do I have to uh, share with others? Ten minutes. Okay. Um, I'll try to be uh, sort of brief and, and general. Uh, there's a few points that I would like to to make. Um, uh, I, I know everyone working on your own respective countries uh, in the region, and China, in a way, is a is an outsider. Um, but uh, because Chinese technology uh, on on the uh, the digital repressive use of the technology has been so pervasive, both domestically and become uh, a, such a functional and affordable uh, uh, a product to export to so many countries in the, in, in, in the regions. So I think the Chinese experience uh, somewhat relevant uh, at here. Um, I have uh, been monitoring uh, the uh, starting from censorship, internet uh, censorship, uh, media, propaganda, disinformation, uh, but along the way to now surveillance technology and AI, uh, what's not that uh, together we call digital authoritarianism. Uh, that's, and I would like to say particular version of Chinese digital authoritarianism uh, is spreading in the world. Uh, I will use uh, Brookings Institute uh, definition, uh, say that what is the digital authoritarianism, which is the use of information technology by authoritarian regimes to surveil, to repress, and to manipulate uh, domestic and foreign populations. Uh, this trend is really on the rise globally. Uh, if you look at it carefully uh, in your own country and the region as well. Uh, so the digital authoritarianism is really eroding basic principles of democracy, open society, undermine individuals to realize their civil political human rights. So let's talk about China's experience. China uh, has built probably the most advanced and digital technology for both domestic censorship surveillance and also become a supplier of choice for in liberal regimes. Um, the, uh, the, the type of technology we are talking here is not only about censorship apparatus uh, to make sure the information doesn't get to the uh, particular those undesirable ones being considered distributed to the regime doesn't reach to Chinese citizens. Uh, also, we're talking about shaping the legal system, strengthening the Chinese party's manipulation of the tools. Um, but we're also talking about the Chinese state has been expanding its vast sum of money to prop up Chinese companies to develop products which enable its authoritarian government's model. Uh, including uh, surveillance cameras, facial recognition capacity, uh, even the uh, uh, sort of goes together with digital Silk Road, uh, which I will mention in a little bit more detail, um, on safe city, smart city, uh, which now exporting to many parts of the world. Um, and I want to also say that the emerging technologies such as uh, a big data, artificial intelligence, mobile app, cloud computing, all of these things are empowering the powerful, you know, uh, uh, becoming, uh, uh, it's enhancing the ability of authoritarian regimes uh, to control the society. The, um, and China has been very forefront of it. 2010, uh, there's about uh, half of Chinese population, right? One half of the 1.4 billion um, reached to online, 
But by the point of 2016, uh, it's more than, yeah, the, 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 the two thirds are connected not only uh, online, but almost everyone has a smartphone. The mobile app was really exploded and really connected uh, Chinese people's every aspect of life. And that, yes, has produced economic productivity and competitiveness for the Chinese uh, companies and, 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 and the Chinese society. But it's also greatly enhanced the ability to monitor and control the population uh, by the state. Because in China, there's no clear line between privacy companies and the state control. And the, the party state can directly have access to uh, those data that private uh, tech corps own for, in the, uh, for the Chinese individuals, whether they're shopping record, whether they are you know, medical record, whether they are transportation record, uh, whether they are residential you know, uh, uh, information, everything. And that's why China has been very successfully controlled coronavirus because ability to control the population through those digital uh, tools and other sort of non-digital but you know, traditional st uh, uh, structure, uh, uh, a political and social structure was very in place. Um, but this gave them a huge uh, comparative uh, advantage in a sense of uh, uh, putting their economy together this time at the coronavirus time, uh, but also their technology become more advanced. For example, they can collect more data um, without privacy protection. Uh, um, uh, their artificial intelligence algorithms are more advanced uh, than many other countries, including the United States. Uh, uh, I'm particularly talking about facial recognition, voice recognition, uh, security ID, and those type of technologies. Um, I want to quickly jump to the, uh, uh, the section of digital Silk Road because uh, we, we, we are uh, really talking about the over 65 countries, according to the Freedom House report, that are um, not only importing those technologies and working with uh, uh, Co surveillance companies, high vision, cloud walk, um, and uh, others. But we're talking about this tens of billions of loans of investment uh, in telecom networks, e-commerce, mobile pay systems, uh, big data projects, satellite relay stations, data centers, fiber cables. All these are fundamental digital communication structures and the uh, data centers, which now under the construction of Chinese companies in so many parts of the world, right? Uh, I'm using a, uh, a report published by the official Chinese Academy of Information and Communication Technology in this April. It mentioned a, a list of Chinese companies expansion, right? Uh, Alibaba, uh, which has been expanding in Southeast Asia, uh, Pakistan, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, ZTE, which is another uh, major Chinese company operating more than 64 countries on the so-called One Bell, One Road China initiative, uh, providing surveillance, mapping, cloud storage, and a data analysis service in cities in Ethiopia, Nigeria, Laos, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Turkey. Yeah. And then there's many companies that uh, uh, you probably haven't heard of the name from the major uh, media headline, such as Guanan Information, which is a Shanghai based big data security analysis firm. And this firm is actually really big in China, very quietly, uh, um, but it's also uh, expanding throughout the world. For example, there are running um, training sessions under the United Nations Asia Pacific Region Economic Information Technology Talent Training Center. Yeah. Uh, so through those multilateral mechanisms, they are training more. They even the last year they trained more than two hundred uh, participants uh, from 
different countries. And those are the talents who will work with Chinese companies to implement those technologies in their own country. Well, you may want to ask, um, what's the problem with uh, those convenient and affordable Chinese technology uh, commercially, economically, technically for those countries that doesn't have uh, a proper infrastructure? Well, the one of the issue is that those same companies, those Chinese companies are being uh, uh, building the surveillance and censorship and control uh, uh, structures domestically in China. So they are technically ca capable of, or have the capacity to provide the same technology to any other countries if those countries are willing to deploy it in the same way or similar way that in, in China being deployed. The te technical capacity is already ready. But if you look at who are the other countries uh, importing those, um, those technologies, uh, there's about, uh, I'm, I'm quoting a Freedom House report, 40% uh, of, 34% uh, of them are non-free countries, 43% of them are partially free countries, uh, uh, including uh, about 36% of them concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and 20% concentrated in Asia. Uh, and most of them are low and middle income countries. So compare with advanced economies, these developing countries have strong demand, low barriers to entry and a fewer security and, and scrutiny uh, because they, they, they also have a weak uh, civil society. Uh, even the uh, Chinese company Huawei, which has been sanctioned by the United States uh, since last year and, and has been on headline. But despite the US sanction, Huawei has been expanding uh, uh, in many parts of the world continually. Um, it's uh, collecting data from citizen health, tax, uh, tax, uh, tax record, legal record, um, you name it. Uh, uh, in, in many of those countries, what it does is in this way, the Chinese government will have a political leverage um, to advance their geopolitical, diplomatic, and economic agenda in those countries since the Chinese company, because Chinese company is providing the crucial uh, infrastructures in those country and crucial technology. Therefore, uh, there's a potential coercive power uh, that giving Chinese government such leverage. Uh, so this is um, kind of bad news uh, uh, for today in many part of the world. Um, I, I will uh, sort of in short, just to say uh, people in different societies of, uh, that needs to wake up to the danger and to recognize this expansion of Chinese digital authoritarianism uh, is a genuine threat to liberal democracy, human rights value in every other society, uh, unless we are in solidarity uh, to uh, push it back, counter this trend. Thank you. Thank you, Zhao. I was waiting for you to pivot to the good news, but I suppose, um, <laughs> I suppose that's not on offer at the moment. Um, but let me actually, um, before we go to the questions uh, uh, from the audience, um, and please do feel free to um, put those questions into the Q&A at this point, um, if you haven't already. Um, let, me off, let me ask um, all of you uh, a couple of questions. And one of them is about that possible pivot to the bright side. And it might, in fact, not be possible. But are there limits to the effectiveness of this kind of digital repression and, uh, and digital authoritarianism? In other words, um, are there uh, possible backlashes that, or unintended consequences which could be triggered by the ubiquity of surveillance and um, and these other forms of control, um, I, I I keep as as awful as everything is. I keep thinking back to a conversation I had with Allah Abdel Fattah in Egypt in 2005, and at that time he was a very uh, prominent blogger. Um, this was before he began uh, going. I mean, this was in between his visits to prison, but um, 
But we were talking about what at the time seemed to be a pervasive surveillance and repression. And I asked him, you know, why, you know, why are you sitting here in a cafe talking to me openly? And he just, he just said, look, if they want to find me, they're going to find me. I see no reason to hide. Uh, I want to be seen. I, I want to build a public sphere and be a part of it. And so I've simply opted to be public about this, knowing full well that I cannot evade surveillance. And that was in 2005, before any of these tools uh, were yet available. And so this is not in any way, shape, or form to minimize the extent of the, of the development of the technology that we've seen. But I wonder if it might simply move activism and independent civil society into different spaces um, where the surveillance and, uh, and specifically the surveillance part of it um, becomes less of an obstacle. Um, and I, I, I can't give you a plausible story by which that happens, but I, I'd like to kind of road test the idea against this assembled group uh, of experts and see if there's any, any prospects there for the unintended consequences of the overreach of these digital authoritarians, whether it's by um, responses by activists or whether it's by legislation or norm development at the international level or some other combination of things. Um, a second question which came from the Q&A, uh, which I wanted to throw out uh, specifically to Andrew, Alexi, and uh, Mark is that the data that you in the data driven presentations was all drawn from Twitter and one of the questions asked what, what would happen if you looked across platforms and started looking at Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. And um, uh, on Tuesday, we began speaking about uh, things like Signal and WhatsApp and the non-public uh, or not fully public types of apps. Um, do you think that your findings, your data uh, would change if you switched off of the Twitter platform and started looking at this more broad multi-platform uh, informational ecosystem? And then finally, since uh, the invitation was has already been um, been uh, put forward, I'll put it out there again myself to Marwa, which is the question of content moderation. And uh, specifically in the case of Palestine right now, I know Marwa, you've been following this very closely um, and we've, we've talked about it a bit offline, um, but it might be useful to think about that as part of this in terms of what do we see in terms of content takedowns and um, not just the manipulation and uh, the bots and the troll armies, but the actual removals by the social media platforms of content related to so whatever is de deemed to be objectionable by the, um, by the uh, governments in question. Um, and why don't we go in the order of the original presentation, start with Marwa and kind of go through and each of you just take a few minutes um, and answer as you like, and then we'll go to whatever questions are in the Q&A box. Marwa? Um, thanks, Mark. I'll start with your last question about content moderation. Um, yeah, I mean, I it's been two painful uh, weeks, if not more, uh, working, organizing, documenting takedowns, restrictions. Uh, communicating with social media companies, escalating cases and so on. And I really like what Mark said towards the end. Um, we don't really, we know what's false, but we don't, we can't really put our finger on what exactly is happening. As you know, Mark, the answers that we've received from Twitter and Facebook uh, about the egregious takedowns and restrictions we've seen. Um, it wasn't only just a matter of taking down or deleting content or suspending accounts, which is you know quite straightforward, but also um, issues of shadow banning, um, a demotion of content and um, lots of content being removed and restricted um, by automation. Which, as all of you know, there's zero transparency from those platforms and how exactly those al algorithms are built and how, how and how they function. And it's, I do agree with Mark that we need a, a paradigm shift because every time there is this kind of um, egregious censorship social media companies um, are ready to present the excuse that, sorry, this was a technical error or a system glitch, which at this point, we, as civil society organizations working on digital rights, our engagement with social media companies have been mainly around escalating cases for them to act on. But at this point, and what happened over the few weeks in Palestine, um, brings and highlights and stresses the importance of shifting the ground from just working on cases to um, first of all having the burden of proof uh, move to the 
to the companies themselves. They are the ones who have the data. They are the ones who should be actively working to detect um, uh, dysfunctions on their platform or whether, for example, their algorithms are demoting content or their spam filters are, are hiding content, etc., or suspending accounts. So it's not on us to come with data to show you, hey, there is a problem. When there is a political movement, when there is a political campaign, those companies know very well that there is something, there is some activity happening on their platforms and they need to take preemptive steps to ensure that their users are um, or can use those, those, their platforms freely and safely. But at the same time, we, are need, we need more transparency, we need more accountability, we need to co-design the content moderation policies that govern our speech. And this is where, um, unfortunately, in our part of the world, in the MENA region, there not only there is no transparency about what exactly are they moderating, but um, there is no investment in resources to understand Arabic content, to understand um, speech intention. Um, and so, Unfortunately, those automated, automated tools, their algorithms keep um, flagging and removing content in a, such a discriminatory uh, and arbitrary manner. Um, so I, I, I mean, to, to wrap up the question on, on, on social media companies and content moderation, unfortunately in our region, as I said, governments on the one hand have made it extremely difficult um, to exercise freedom of expression online because a lot of they can easily criminalize speech um, through vague and broad um, provisions and legislation like the cybercrime law. Um, so we we rely on those we rely on those uh, platforms, and in our case, maybe this model of self-regulation has worked to protect users in the region from direct censorship of, of governments and interference. And obviously they use other tools and tactics as we've, um, Mark and Andrew and others have shown in order to have, have a battle of narrative. You can't, take ta you can't take down content directly. So what do you do? You try to drown the narrative. You try to counter it through other means. But um, obviously the conversation has evolved in other democratic spaces like the US and, and, the, and the EU where clearly there is a need for regulation and we can't continue having those private companies dictating um, the contours of discussions and speech online. Um, if we bring that kind of legislation or that line of thought into the region, it's just bad news because you can't hand uh, regulation of platforms to authoritarian regimes. And so there's a formula where, unfortunately, I, I still can't figure it, figure it out from a policy perspective, um, because we are really in a, between a hard place and a rock or whatever that expression, uh, however that expression goes. Um, and yeah, I forgot what was the first part of the question, but maybe I'll go, I'll come back maybe, to it later. Andrew and Alexi, and then um, maybe come back if you'd like, uh, Andrew. Yeah, I guess I'll just say one thing on the consequences of overreach. I think that the, one of the consequences has been that just people flee to like anybody who has critical views either hides in anonymity or flees to like ever narrower digital spaces. And then, you know, some degree of organizing can certainly still take place in these areas, but it's very different than being able to sort of put out a public narrative that other people can see and try to build support or consensus if you're limited to like very small, tight-knit cells of individuals who everybody has to trust everyone else. And it's really hard to like expand that out when you're sort of in fear of being discovered. And even there sort of raises security problems. Like if, even if you're on an encrypted app, if one person is arrested and their phone is open and they look through the, the, the group to see who's in there, then, you know, that's, that's like now a common tactic as well. If you pick up one activist, check their phone and see who else they've been chatting with for a while and then go on from there. Um, not that, that may be particularly new, but, um, but I guess one sort of consequence I think about sometimes, I never know if this is ever going to really be a thing, but sometimes like, something I see in Saudi media is that this question of how independent any of these regime aligned influencers are sometimes gets a little odd because some of them occasionally get nationalistically, in Saudi Arabia, get nationalistically angry about things that it's not clear that the state necessarily wanted them to get angry about. So, you know, some journalists will put just a an article out saying like, well, I'm, I'm very patriotic and love the, everything about the Saudi regime, but like maybe we could be less nasty to people online and then they'll just like attack this person for you know, some of these influencers will attack them for days or more recently over the last summer, it hit the point where 
state run media, not even like state regulated private Saudi media, but like the official Akhbaria TV show started running programs that were like, you know, boy, like some people are getting a little too, you know, crazy online these days, you know, saying like, no, nah, you know, trying to distinguish like, well, of course we, we like people to be patriotic and supportive online, but some people are taking advantage, you know, trying to, the suggestion being that like, you know, maybe some people were taking this a bit too far. I mean, that's a long way off from people posing any kind of real threat to the regime. And generally we find that as long as there's like clear talking points issued from uh, some sort of official that like no one's really challenging that, but occasionally there is this possibility of maybe something getting out of control. And I guess just the last thing is that, you know, these regimes still seem you know, very obsessed with controlling these platforms rather than shutting them down completely, which means that on some occasions that still leaves sort of a vector open to challenge. So we saw, I think recently with respect to Palestine and a lot of Gulf countries that have been slowly trying to lay the groundwork to like downplay the Palestinian cause to you know, eliminate any sort of pro-Palestinian content online. I think one of the reasons we saw some statements that backed off on that a little bit recently was because despite all of the sort of signals that you shouldn't talk about Palestine online for a lot of sort of you know, people tweeting under their own name were very, comfortable still going on criticizing Israel, championing the Palestinian cause and so on. So it's still, as long as these platforms aren't completely shut, I still think that there's always going to be the possibility of some unforeseen mobilization there, but you know, more what form unclear. So I'll end there. Alexei. Yeah, thanks. Um, on, uh, on, the, on the question of whether your re results would change if we looked at other platforms, I can't answer directly. There is a preponderance of, of papers on, on Twitter because Twitter's API is particularly, has been particularly generous whereas Facebook kind of went the other direction and completely closed up, uh, except in the case of um, scholars with a, a unique relationship with them. But uh, I am conducting research on the Ukraine with a co-author at um, Zurich. And so in which we, co we, we conduct a survey uh, and ask people about what what their sources of media are, and then also run a set of uh, narratives that we know are associated with um, the narratives that the, that the Russian government has been trying to push in the Ukraine region. Um, and it was notable that actually Twitter and Facebook were very uncorrelated with uh, receptivity and agreement with these narratives. Um, so it was actually through a few unique YouTube channels and then several TV channels that are indirectly owned by a pro-Russian Ukrainian oligarch. And those were actually, those seem to be the vectors by which um, folks were, were receiving Russian disinfo. So um, if, if, that, uh, if that partially answers the question. On content moderation, I would say, so I've started to look into this um, for the Palestinian case, again, building off um, uh, what Marwa and Actis Now and Hamle have already turned up. Um, one interesting thing to note is that um, so major figures of the Hamas political wing are not actually, um, their accounts are not automatically suspended by Twitter. So it, it's a different handling of Hamas than you would see of, uh, for example, the Islamic State. Um, so actually, during the last few weeks, uh, Ismail Haniyeh and I think uh, Musa Abu Marzouk um, were, were tweeting, um, and Twitter was not taking down their tweets. Uh, but what I noticed is they, the tweets were being withheld in Israel. So uh, social media, uh, uh, Twitter users within Israel, and I, I'm not sure, possibly within the occupied territories, um, were unable to see these tweets. But they were Twitter did not actually take them down. And so I had a look into this. So, you know, I think what's happening is social media platforms, Twitter included, are just they're, they're grafting on all of the same shades of gray that we have when we, when we think about political militant organizations. So they have, a, they have a page, you can look it up on how they deal with violent organizations. And they say, well, first of all, if it's a state, we just, we let them speak um, regardless, um, which I don't think is entirely true, but you know, mostly. And then uh, violent organizations, that's against our terms of service. But if they are reforming or have won democratic elections, then we allow them some, some further space. So there, you know, I don't, there's a lot of weird shades of gray going on with the content moderation. Um, and I think it, 
it speaks to society's uh, indecisiveness also with regard to some of these organizations. Um, and I think the social media platforms have no other ideology than just their kind of profit-driven bottom line. Um, but they, but it, they, it's interesting how that sort of grabs onto them. Um, and the only final point was just on the that that kind of fatalistic attitude about surveillance, uh, Mark, that you mentioned um, from the uh, the activist, if you said uh, who um, that you spoke to in, in Egypt. Um, that's been noted elsewhere. It's kind of a it's kind of a depressing attitude, but it's something that comes up in some interviews in actually a paper from several years ago now by Bill Marchak um, and uh, Vern Paxson, uh, in which they 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 look at the security cybersecurity practices of uh, activists and journalists and media related folks in Middle East North Africa, and um, there is a fatalism around digital surveillance, which uh, is surprising and a bit disappointing and kind of, uh, I'll be presenting next week on some, some cybersecurity uh, scanning that I've been doing. And there too, I wonder if there's a fatalism that that partially explains the insecurities that I observe there, but I'll leave it at that. I wonder if the reporting on the extent of the, uh, of the surveillance creates that fatalism. We only have about five minutes left. So let's go to Mark and Dejao and uh, to do what you can in the time we have remaining. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I just on that surveillance point, I always think there was uh, when I when I started out looking at surveillance, I remember reading a paper on surveillance, which was about surveillance from below. The idea, I think, man came up with this idea where you 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 surveil those in authority, right? So in theory, you know, as people become more savvy and and tools become more ubiquitous, you know, they can be turned around on other people. But again, there's a double-edged sword. You could argue that you know one of the things about the Arab uprisings was the ability to surveil the regime's oppression and brutality against its citizens. Uh, and that is powerful in the sense that it can generate outrage uh, and facilitate mobilization. But at the same time, it can also spread fear just in the way that, you know, back in uh, hundreds of years ago, they'd have public corporal punishment in town squares. The whole point was to scare people uh, and, and show them the consequence of the action. If you leak a video of police brutality, sure, some people will be outraged, but some people will also be terrified. Right. So there's always like a, a kind of double edged shores about the possibilities of these surveillance. Uh, that's I think is interesting. And um, just briefly on the, the notion about Twitter and other social media platforms. I think I, I view Twitter as almost like a corridor and often uh, other social media platforms like YouTube and things as like offshoots. What we tend to see now, I think, particularly in the Gulf, is uh, this notion of breakout. So there is a connection between the different social media platforms that are, are part of campaigns. So just to give an example, when um, there was a, a, a fake coup. There was the rumors of a coup in Qatar last year that didn't happen. But what they did, they started on social media. They started on Twitter. There was tweets about a potential fake coup, but they included links to YouTube videos that showed like gunshots. Uh, and then this generated this massive kind of online thing that influencers got involved in. This then broke out into more traditional mainstream media that then generated further YouTube videos, clips of Arabia reporting on the story. So what you tend to see is there's this almost a playbook where like a rumor can start on Twitter that gives it the kind of authenticity of it being a bottom up legitimate story. And then that's picked up by the news organizations who I'm sure in most cases probably know it's not true. And then it's perpetuated across other social media sites and legacy media. And so I think you have to look at it as an ecosystem. Twitter plays a very kind of important role, I think, in the Gulf. And whilst you said that Facebook is more common in the Middle East, it does depend. I think in North Africa, that's certainly the case, but not in the Gulf where Twitter is, is, is more common. And, and just as a final point, I think the Twitter thing, the fact that it is transnational is a huge issue. Uh, I mean, the, the fact is that who can dominate that discussion is the people with the most Twitter accounts and the most, uh, in theory, the larger population near the Gulf, that's Saudi. Uh, and, and I think that discrepancy, that asymmetry, which was highlighted again by Alexi and Andrew, I think is important to bear in mind. And that has ramifications for all other social media platforms and how that stuff is reported. I'll stop there. Thanks, Mark. And uh, I understand that many people might need to leave at 1.30 precisely, but if people will uh, uh, would like to stay, um, I would like to give Zhao a few minutes to, um, to add his final thoughts. I'll say very briefly, um, uh, to, particularly regarding to the first question, 
um, remember the before Arabic Spring or after Arabic Spring and in, in, in until probably 2012, 2013, 14, um, the more optimistic side about this technology is that it's a liberation uh, uh, mechanism. I was one of those uh, very hopeful people that hope that uh, uh, this libera uh, liberation um, uh, uh, aspect of technology can help uh, mostly freedom of information freedom of expression uh the people have the ability to coordinate collective actions right as demonstrated in during the arabic spring um what has changed i will i don't want to call it fatalistic uh, uh depression but reality what changed is the technology itself the big data and artificial intelligence which makes the which empower the powerful now instead of empowering just empowering the powerless, the um, and it bring the economic and social and even public health benefits for the general society or the convenience, but at the same time giving authoritarian regime particularly a such a extensive power they never had it before, and we have to recognize that reality for now. Uh, which being a, a civil society and activist, we just need to be broaden our mind to see the real challenges and to see where we can play a role in changing policy and working with other sectors in the society, uh, not simply just continue to advocate freedom expression and freedom association, those basic values, but put into the larger context of technological and the political economic infrastructure. Thank you. And transnationally too, as well. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists and to uh, everyone in the audience who, uh, who stayed with us and submitted like, good questions. And I'd just like to remind you that there are two more seminars in this um, four-part series. Uh, we will be convening again at the same time at uh, the 12 o'clock Eastern time, Tuesday and Thursday of next week. And uh, we hope to uh, continue these conversations. So thank you all. And uh, I will see you on Tuesday.